My wife is smarter than me. <laughs> so it's not completely a surprise, if you know about DNA, that my son is smarter than me. I am not, however, the stupidest one in the house. Because, you see, we have a dog. <laughs> How do I know that I'm smarter than the dog? Because I can beat her at chess two out of three. <laughs> so um, here, here's what I'm, I'm going to be telling you. Uh, I'm going to show 18 or 19 slides for one minute each, which if I've done my math professor work correctly should come out to 18 or 19 minutes. But I'm told that Homeland Security has gotten your armed guards out of the building. If we run a little over, I'm allowed to live. Now, what I'm going to tell you is that in science fiction, we see many different intelligent species interacting, fighting, cooperating, and sometimes falling in love against species boundaries. We've already heard about a musician who can make a Vulcan cry. It's going to be humans and Vulcans and orcs and ants and Klingons, you name it. On this actual planet, our DNA in every cell of your body combines the DNA of four different species which are sort of kind of people depending how you define people. And it varies depending whether you're Euro-American or Asian, exactly what the balance of that DNA is. But your DNA includes the DNA from the, the Cro-Magnon uh, uh, people, uh, maybe 200,000 years ago, the Neanderthal, who coexisted with us for a long time. We traded. Uh, I swear every once in a while I see someone uh, who, um, if you took off the suit and tie, would look just like a Neanderthal. <laughs> also, you may never have heard this word before, you can Google it, Denisovian. D-E-N-I-S-O-V-I-A-N. -E Denisovians were discovered in Siberia, and they're sort of related to Neanderthals, and they're sort of related to us, and we didn't even know they existed until one finger bone was analyzed for its DNA. And the fourth homonym is the technical word for things which are sort of people-like, but, but different from chimpanzees and orangutans. The fourth homonym, we're not really sure in your DNA, it might be so-called Homo erectus from two or three million years ago in Africa. So by DNA, we're all Africans. So now the question arises, what can we learn about evolving a sustainable community from the vision of science fiction that I open with to the current research of trusted neuroscientists and molecular biologists. So what you got to do is Google the phrase, quote, is your gut conscious, unquote, and you'll get some really far out stuff. <laughs> now, life as we know it, you can learn about that in any biology class. You can see it on the Nature Channel or the Discover Channel. How about life as we don't know it? So we use a tentative new definition of thinking designed to be applicable for humans, cetacea, whales and dolphins, corvids, crows and rooks are very, very smart birds. They make tools, um, artificial intelligences, and extraterrestrial intelligences of any substrate, whatever they're made out of, superconductor, semiconductor, gas, liquid, solid, plasma beings that live inside of stars. Here's the definition of thinking. Thinking is the occurrence, transformation, and storage in a mind or brain or simulation thereof of information-bearing structures, representations of one kind or another, such as thoughts, concepts, percepts, ideas, impressions, notions, rules, schemas, images, phantasms, or subpersonal relations.
So, uh, uh, as you said in the introduction, we're, we're going from the terroir of uh, the San Gabriel uh, Valley area, Los Angeles City, Los Angeles County, out into the universe. Now, now this guy, who's not a scientist, he's just wearing a white uh, coat. <laughs> I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. I had suggested that I could like segue smoothly from kitchen garden to how do you make a kitchen garden on Mars. But you know, that's thinking really small. The, right? The universe is really, really big. So, so a line from one piece of science fiction that, that I was working on uh, uh, this week, and I'll explain the technical terms later in a poem. I had grown up as the son of two colonist stockholders in asteroid 21 Lutetia. The possibility of humankind expanding beyond the Kuiper belt into the Oort cloud and then to exoplanets looks inevitable now in retrospect since the roughly 2050 arrival of the first practical robotic interstellar spacecraft to the Alpha Centauri system. So I'm going to read, I'm going to read a, a, a little about of this, not, not all of it. Noah's Ark Eggs and Viviparous Plants by Freeman Dyson and Jonathan Voss Post. Science fiction stories about starships usually depict the universe, but we need to get our grips on notions more diverse. As a collection of stars and planetary systems separated by vast stretches of empty space, but there is a better way in any case. M moving, moving on, now that we're halfway out to the stars. And, and by the way, that's, a, that's an interesting notion, because if you watch science fiction movies and TVs, you know, you get in the Enterprise or the Starship, whatever, or, you know, Babylon 5, you go through a wormhole and boom, there you are. No, I, I actually don't think so. I think, we need, I think we need to take our terroir. I think we need to take the stuff that we know, the good soil, the, the plants and animals that we're part of. This is our job uh, for this ecology. We are the ones, we are the Johnny Appleseeds who will spread that out into the universe. We are not above nature. We are part of nature. So what is it if we're a part of everything that has chimpanzees and orangutans and giraffes and crows and, and whales, what is it that makes us unique? And there's a wonderful uh, uh, notion invented by uh, uh, Mark Hauser, uh, who's the author of a number of books such as Moral Minds. And, and, and just like my friend Timothy Leary, wasn't considered a complete crackpot because after all he'd been on faculty for psychology at Harvard. Mark Hauser may or may not be a crackpot, but he was on the uh, faculty for uh, uh, psychology at, at Harvard. And this is what he said in a Scientific American article in September 2009. Um, first, first he talked about Charles Darwin. He said, Darwin argued that a continuity of minds exists between humans and other animals. It is a difference of degree and not kind in Darwin's own words, a view that subsequent squalors, squalors, scholars living in squalor, you know, the pay isn't as good as it used to be. Um, but mounting evidence by the experts in biology and, and botany and physiology, people who study the, the life on our, our little planet, say that there are a number of things that, that make us think differently not necessarily better, but differently from every other creature on this planet. And he invented the term humaniqueness, which means human uniqueness. He said, if humans were observed by hypothetical aliens, if the flying saucers came down and looked at us objectively, they, they would say that there is a large mental gap that separates uh, uh, humans from their owners, the automobiles. Well, that, that's what you'd think if you looked in Los Angeles, right? <laughs> but what human beings would clearly have to any objective extraterrestrial observer is that we appear to have a system for creating new expressions, and that system is infinitely more powerful than those of all other living kinds. Um, 
So, so unlike animal thoughts, which are pretty much anchored in the real immediate world of sensory experience, um, a lot of what we're thinking about has no direct connection to the physical world. Um, and therefore, human beings alone ponder the likes of unicorns, aliens, nouns, verbs, infinity, or God. And therefore, our species alone creates souffles, computers, guns, makeup, plays, operas, sculptures, equations, laws, religions, and TEDx events. <laughs> so um, a lovely word relevant to everything we've been saying about uh, uh, the, the, the ecologies and the terroir is terraforming. Now terraforming literally means earth shaping. You talk about terraforming a, a planet, a moon, or some other body which so far is the merely theoretical process of deliberately modifying its atmosphere, temperature, surface topography, or ecology to be similar to the biosphere of Earth to make it habitable to Earth life. Now the term terraforming is also sometimes called planetary engineering. And you're going to be happy with that if you're happy with the economic engineering that we've seen in, in the last few years. Uh, you know, we crashed the world economy. Americans lost $12 trillion. Are you going to trust those guys with PhDs to, like, change the whole world? Hmm, just saying, just saying. <laughs> the concept of terraforming, uh, the actual term, in fact, was coined by a science fiction writer called Jack Williamson, who traveled west in a covered wagon through Indian territory to what's now the state of New Mexico, and whom I brought to JPL to see the Voyager 2 spacecraft, for which I was mission planning engineer, fly by the planet Uranus two billion miles away. Now that's a life. So Jack Williamson published this, uh, that phrase and the story in 1942 in Astounding Science Fiction, which is now the magazine Analog. So one of my takeaway messages is you want to read some stuff, don't bother reading me, Read the science fiction writers who've been thinking the deep thoughts for a long time and have put it into human narratives, into stories that can grab you. And, you know, like, I know I'm doing well in my 2,000 words if I burst out laughing while I'm writing or if I feel tears running down my cheeks. Because if you can't do that, it's not, it's not significant art. So the problem is, although we might be able to uh, uh, create uh, terraforming on Mars so that we could literally have our kitchen garden outside in the regolith of, of Mars, we have a lot of unanswered questions before we start messing with other planets. My, my theory is, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm wrapping it up here. My, my theory is, my theory is that, that if we start trying to change the environment of Mars, the organization Red Peace will start ecological terrorism, and then the real fanatics will start Gray Peace, saying don't mess with the moon. So, so skipping, skipping ahead, let me just leave you with four, four questions. I'm, I'm going to do something else uh, after this, but, but, but four, four good questions. How can I tell if I'm dreaming? How can I tell if I'm crazy? How can I tell if I'm a character in TV or a movie or, or a novel? And, and, and bottom line, as we've said, we're in an ecosystem. It's a network. Uh, uh, plants rise and fall and businesses rise and fall, and nations rise and fall, and empires rise and, and fall. I, I could say uh, a lot more about, about thinking and neurophysiology, but let me just, again, a, a, the pre-closing thought is, read Isaac Asimov, my late friend and, and editor. Um, read uh, uh, Ray, Ray Bradbury, uh, who people will be reading a thousand years from now on planets not yet discovered. Um, read Sir Arthur C. Clarke, who invented the communication satellite and never made a penny of profit. Read Robert Heinlein, who is the dean of American science fiction. And if, there, if there's one guy alive, a scientist, I don't have time to, to uh, tell you much about him, but if you Google the name uh, Baron May of Oxford, you'll get a guy who, when he was 22, changed ecology uh, forever. So finally, in summation, what have I told you? 
we have at least four human species in our DNA. It is our destiny to colonize moons and planets and, and uh, uh, the Kuiper belt with our, um, our ecosystem. And along the way, we will discover what we really need to know in understanding sustainable communities. To sustainably go out to the stars, we are going to make Earth a better and more sustainable place. Thank you.